Welcome back to the Cog Weekly Podcast, Season 4, Episode 9. Yes, we are here again, Episode 9, and I'm going to start us off with one word. I know everyone who's been following the podcast sort of knows that I'm currently rooming with a Brazilian roommate, and today we have someone Brazilian on, so I'm just going to put it out there. Fala Galera! What's up, guys? How is everyone doing? I hope you're all doing well. We're back again with another another interview. If you didn't know, that is like what's up, guys in Bra- or in Portuguese. Um, it's what my Brazilian roommate says all the time. So I, I sort of brought it here to the podcast today. But if you guys don't know who he is, who's on the screen in front of you guys right now, we have. Well, first I would say I'm wearing the champion hat right now because we do have a real champion in the podcast we do. today. Yeah. That's why I wore it. We have a, a real champion on the podcast today. He is an MLS champion, an NASL MVP, and an NASL Golden Boot winner. We have Mr. Pablo Campos here. We're so excited to have you, Pablo. How are you doing? I'm pretty well. Well, that's a good introduction. And, <laughs> and I'm so happy to, to be part of that. We have been talking for, for a long time. So we finally, uh, you know, got our schedule to work and kind of going to share some stories and I'm going to talk soccer. Yes, sir. Yes. Talk soccer more. Oh, yeah. More Pe- people don't get enough of it. No one gets enough of the soccer these days. So we're bringing more to them. And we're just going to start out with your early career. So just so that the people know, we always do this sort of your inspirations into the game. What made you fall in love with the game? Oftentimes people mention a a mentor, maybe a family member, their father or friend, or sometimes it was an experience like watching a certain World Cup or other events. But usually they refer to those moments as their sort of driving factor of getting them into the game. But what was that for you? Uh, Well, in Brazil, you know, um, we all talk about soccer. We all want to play, want to be a professional soccer player. So it's kind of like the culture in Brazil. I think that's a compared to the culture here. So you understand it's like football, you want to be a football player, you want to be a basketball player or a baseball player. And in Brazil, uh, if somebody said that you never thought about being becoming a, a, a professional soccer player, he may be lying to you, you know. <laughs> so it, it's either at some moment of your of your life, you're going to think about it. And I think it that's what it got me into soccer probably. But I had my family uh, on my mom's side, I had a uncle that actually played professionally. He made it to the you know Flamengo team, the a big team in Brazil. But I think he he had a, a accident that didn't uh, actually let him like follow his his dream. Uh, it was actually death. It's not like oh he actually hurt his knee. No, he passed away. But yeah, we we had some soccer in, in the family in the genes, and also culturally, that's what, that's what we got into you. So that's why I think that's how you started, you know. And I it was pretty young, and I started sleeping with my ball when I was like three or four. So when my mom got my got the ball, I will I will kiss the ball, I will sleep with the ball, I will do everything with the ball, and. Sometimes, yeah, that's yeah, the passion sometimes. that we love to see. That's the passion that we love yes, to see. It is. I don't know if either of you guys know this story, but um, it's reminding me of the Michael Jordan sort of like salt in, in your shoes story. Um, did you ever hear about that, Mac or Pablo? It sounds familiar, I think. Yeah, he would every single night he would put salt in his like his basketball shoes um, because apparently if he did that and then like you wore them the next day, it would make him taller because he was pretty short when he was in early <laughs> high school. Um, and then suddenly Michael Jordan was incredibly tall and became like one of the best basketball players, if not the best. I mean, that's a debate that we don't go to or talk about here, but <laughs> one of the best basketball yeah. <laughs> No, we aren't. Yeah. But he ended up being one of the best, best basketball players ever. And the story of you saying like you sleep with your ball, it's that passion to, to want to get better, want to succeed, even if it's not on the training field, if it's not in the gym or it's not, you know, in your nat- like natural eating habits or whatever it is that you're trying to do to improve your game, it's just that passion that translates throughout your entire life. So it's definitely evident. We've seen that in a lot of interviews. And I mean, right away, you touch on that. Like, it's just, it's a, it's a real passion for the game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, I know, like everything that I, my, my action, my life was about all around the ball, you know, so kind of like treat her well. 
but he got some accidents when you sleep with your ball. You know, you wake up, and <laughs> you, you step, you step on it, and then you fall, or you you sleep with the ball under your head, and you wake up with a neck problem. Yeah. So there's there, there's some problems with your passion, but yeah, yeah it's it's everything was around soccer. Yeah, it, it's the commitment that that matters. Um, yeah. But so you're sleeping with the ball. You're at a young age. When did you start? your first uh, club team or real competitive team in Brazil? Oh, man. There, um, there's a funny story about that. Um, so in Brazil, we have uh, – now MLS started with the academies. So now they're actually yeah. doing the same same thing in Brazil. And we started an academy, and then you actually work your, yourself up to, to the professional team uh, in Brazil. But the thing – the difference is – here normally uh every state has one mls club uh, if you go to california maybe you got c2 in, in new york maybe you see two but majority of other states they just have one but in brazil in the state you can find many 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 many, many uh, other professional clubs so there's like a very it's very competitive and then you play against teams on uh, from your own state and in brazil we have uh, the academies and one day I was going to, I actually was with my club, my youth club, not the professional academy. So I was with my youth and we play a tournament that one of the, the professional youth academies uh, was there. And, but normally they, they wouldn't be there because normally they play against them and they play in the tournament, the, you know, the national tournament. But I think something happened and they, they end up playing with, I think their second team of that tournament. So they play against my team, and then the coach really liked me, and he said to my mom, "Say, can you bring Pablo uh, on, to, on Thursday next next week, so we we can set up so he can train with us and see how he does with uh, with your players." My mom said, yeah, "Sure, let's do it." And in my city that I was living in, we have two clubs. One's called Ponte Preta, and the other one is called Guarani. And the fun part of between them is like one stadium is like half a mile from the other stadium. So when they play against each other, they actually meet in one stadium stadium and they walk to all the way together as, you know, as, as a team, the fans walk all the way to the other uh, stadium. So it's like uh, tailgating. It's a big, it's a big event. And so we actually went there. Uh, on Thursday, as he said, and we, my mom, uh, waited in the lobby. Like, oh, we actually gonna um, come to you and and take Pablo in. It's like, okay, no problem. But the thing is, they took too long. My, my mom was waiting. My mom was waiting. My mom, my mom was like, no, that's not how you treat your players. Even though you're not, you're not a player yet, but it could be. So that's not how you treat. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go down to the other club and that's where you're going to start i said wow. are you sure are you sure i say yeah I say mom are you sure because this is the opportunity that you know not many players have and you know i have a person to train no pablo i'm telling you let's go to the other stadium so we went down which is like half a mile we drove there she parked as we actually walk into the stadium the team is coming out to train because their facility is like a block from the stadium. So they kind of like walk a block and then get, they get in the facility. And the coach was coming out, coming out. As we walk in, I was like, oh man, oh man, that's that guy got to be destiny. So he, my mom say, listen, I actually don't know you. You probably don't know my, my son, but he got invited to, you know, to have this practice with this team. They took too long. I don't think you try to explain the situation. The coach like, oh, can you tell Pablo to come here on Monday? Yeah, you'll be on Monday. <laughs> so I got there on Monday. We trained with the team. The guy liked me, and then that's how started it. And that was like how actually the beginning was pretty pretty interesting. And and that that team was amazing. You know, we we had great players. One of you guys are probably gonna know it's Elano from the the national team that he was from that era. And we have a great team that we we beat everyone. 
uh, that year nationally, you know, so we play against like Flamengo, you know, Vasco, big, big clubs. And, and we won even the, there is back in the days, there was a tournament called Copa Zico from the, the, the player Zico that if you win, you play a tournament in Japan, everything oh, wow. paid for. Yeah. Everything paid for. So that's how we started it. And it started with this club and it, they prepare you to, to become, um, a professional uh, player so it's it's very competitive it's just, they recruit nationally and because here at mls we have a little bit more of the the zip code not every team can get players from everywhere they have to respect the 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 clubs that they they're recruiting from because if you if if a chicago fire comes to minnesota to get player from me um uh, minnesota they, they may not be allowed but in brazil no you can actually recruit any player from anywhere hmm. yeah that's that's so interesting i really like i i respect the the amount of risk-taking ability that your mom has after listening to that story i think that's really cool like that how much she respected you how much she wanted you to be respected and then also the ability and willingness to say no we're going to take this risk we're going to go to this other club because i want my son to be treated right do you think that the value uh, from that story and then also from other times that like within your childhood that she sort of expressed that same sort of value do you think that that translated to sort of the rest of your life and the rest of your soccer career? Do you think that that like that ability to want to be treated well and respected with your clubs and also want to to take risks and go for things that might be better for your career? Do you think that that translated? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, for sure, because uh, that's one of the things that I actually, you know, keep talking to uh, ex expressing to to the new players and the, everybody that i talk to and sometimes some players sound really cocky and they arrogant because that's not the way they probably the way they're perceived but it's not the way they they actually are it's just they they the, the set mind that you have to to be to play well so in a game if you really want to perform and you want to you know bring out your best uh, player that you are or the blessed character that you are you have to believe that you're the best yeah and sometimes when you when you think that you're the best sometimes you're gonna sound like you think you're the best and you're yeah you're your god you know so but if you talk to, to that player a day after the game you're he, he gonna sound way different you're gonna sound a, a different person so i i kind of like start to understand that and try and from what my mom kind of like taught me and my dad as well that if if they respect you you're going to be respect and but first you got to respect yourself so if if you see you not being respect that that's not a good that's not a good scenario and and from that on i started building my confidence over that and say okay so probably you are really capable of and you're you 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 think i think that i can do things and from that from that point on, that's when I started playing better. Because it's not about performance, not about talent, it's not about skills. If you don't have your your mind and your confidence up, it nothing is gonna gonna work out. You cannot perform. You cannot actually. You're gonna be afraid of uh, making mistakes. You're gonna be afraid of you know taking plays. So, and I think that was uh, the first thing that uh, that uh, that she taught me. Like, look. You're important. Doesn't matter what situation you are, you gotta you gotta respect yourself. You gotta believe that you're capable of. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, you did you move up before you went to the United States? Um, did you move up through that academy? How many years was that before you then moved, made that move from Brazil um, to the U.S.? Yeah, so I stayed there. And then I met my my agent, my my uh, future agent, and and also became a, a great friend. We we still uh, talk to this day. And I think um, when actually I I met him, he he found me a, a club in Rio. That's why I transferred from mm. one academy in São Paulo to academy in Rio. I went to play for Botafogo. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the team that uh, Garrincha. I don't know if you guys heard about Garrincha. Yeah, Garrincha with the legs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> with the legs. So that's the team that he he played for, and that's what I went I went to to play it was it another interesting uh, uh, thing because when I was actually driving to to Rio, um, the first team that I was going to was Flamengo. And in the middle of the the course, and the, we're driving, he switched to to Botafogo, which was very interesting. But I said, "Well, it happened that before, and I, it worked out." So yep. <laughs> I think I think that's how it is, you know. Do it again, the, yeah. Do, again, and I and I didn't I didn't actually to this day I don't know what happened exactly. My agent never told me, and I should ask that uh we yeah we switched teams and maybe they didn't treat uh, me or him right and so he 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 changed the you know the course as we driving and the distance is like between let's say here to chicago so in these four okay. five hours yeah in these four or five hours things changed so we're gonna got there but it was a great experience uh you know i got to to play against great players and again the gear your experience because the the youth in brazil it's it, they're high it's a, a very high level and yeah and I, and that's what everything starts uh, you know changing and and cooking to to the next trip to brazil to united states so and to answer your question uh when i was there i i actually in between things and uh, after I, I was I was done con- done with Botafogo, I actually uh, uh, college contacted me from Brazil, and then they wanted me to to play. And the first time they actually started doing the same the same thing that at the college United States, they were giving a scholarship to players to play for the t- their team and study in the in college. I was like, oh, that's a that's a great setup. I didn't know much about what what's going on here in the United States, but I knew that it was kind of like the same here. And I started playing for this university that for the first year they they had a team. And funny enough, like I scored the first goal ever for the for the college. Really? Really? <laughs> yes. Yes. And the first goal and then a big like newspaper from actually from from real reach out to me and they wanted to be in the real because it was the first goal of the, the college and so i called my mommy she was living in the united states at the time it's like mommy came by the apartment probably probably is famous you know jokingly but yeah that's how, <laughs> how it started and that's how I actually got into uh wanted to know more what's going on in the united states so the college the the scholarship the the tournaments here and that's that's how I always started. And then after I got to know more, I start start talking to people more. I I receive a, a invite from a, a coach, Brazilian coach that was in Oklahoma, that he said he's gonna do a a tryout uh, in in Rio, and he wanted me to go. I was like, sure, I I want to go because my mind was more into it because I was more okay. Let's do the the youth academies let's go professionally but after i got this you know scholarship and and, and teams in in brazilian colleges it opened my mind so i went to this tryout i got there they had like uh 44 people so there will be four teams so my team was the third play and i waited to play the the first two played and then my time my turn came and the funny enough, it was a it was a great field, like very very well uh, taken care of. And when I got in the game, I scored four goals in like twenty minutes. Wow. So no the guy, way. yeah, that's <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, four goals it, in know, twenty minutes immediately was okay. The question I have for you then is: Was the competition in this showcase within Brazil for players to go to this Oklahoma school? Was that competition lower than what you felt like you were playing either at the previous university in Brazil or at academies, or did you just have a really good day? 
No, for sure, for sure, it's not the same as the academy because the academy they have the top, top, you know, like the the, the players that are really uh, invested in. They are there for a long time. They're prime players, you know. Yeah. So no, for sure, it's not the same level. But it, it's also very hard to score goals in a tryout where everybody very wants tough. to, sh- yeah, yeah, where everybody wants to shine. Nobody wants to pass you the ball. I want to do my thing. Yeah. Um. So you but, had a pretty, you, know, you had a pretty good day too. Like that was, that was a pretty solid was like, time. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. It was like everything was going right, and the ball was falling on my feet. And it was like okay, so some, you know, sometimes some days it, it everything works. So that's that's that that was that day, and then you know after that, the the coach reached out to me, and say, Pablo, you know, I want to offer you the full ride. So he offered me a full ride. I will not pay anything. I will not pay for food, for housing, for no, I wouldn't pay for books. And so that's something that I cannot resist. And even though, and, and my, my parents were pressuring me to, to finish, uh, you know, my education. And the only thing that I could do, finish my education well, and now I should play soccer, that would be the United States. If I stayed in Brazil, my my education and you know school would not be my focus and I probably not gonna go for like college and so it's like okay that's a that's a huge thing that they put in front of me you know uh, soccer and school actually we gotta say first school and soccer <laughs> <'Cause> you're, <laughs> when you come here that's what you have to say yeah yeah you're you're a student you're a student athlete you're not athlete student so. Mm. That's why the that that that's why it comes first. So yeah, and I keep it, yeah, and it's good that you guys, uh, you know, doing this and you're actually in school and because if you don't if you don't do well if you don't have grades you're not gonna play. So who come first? You know. Yeah. Yeah. If, definitely. So and then we're gonna talk about later when when we start with a college experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So did you then was part of you kind of like oh. If I stay in Brazil, I might have a better chance of going professionally, playing professionally earlier in your career. Or were you more very much focused on the education part and weren't worrying about, you know, your career path and getting to have that professional contract early on? Yeah, well, yeah, for sure in Brazil, I'll be more focused in getting, you know, play professionally. But it, because my my parents were and they were right they wanted me to to be in school mm-hmm. and but yeah for sure i'll i'll have taken and i'll be way way quicker to to be a professional in brazil than i would would have been in the united states yes because in the united states you you have you have to go through college which takes you four more years than you normally take you know yeah, yeah. one question i have is and and this might be really easy for you to answer or not, um, but do you think that the the extra obstacle of maybe having to balance school with football, having to organize your time well, be a good student athlete and all that, do you think that the skills you developed doing that actually would have made you or did make you a better professional in the long run? Because I do know some people, and I feel myself sometimes, that the the straight path to what you want to accomplish isn't always the best way there and if you if you sometimes have to go through obstacles you'll be better off in the end you'll succeed at a higher rate in the end so yeah maybe you would have gone professionally earlier if you stayed in brazil but do you think there's a chance that you went farther and were able to accomplish more because of the path that you went on um I would not, it's hard to say as a professional athlete, I would say as a person nice. in a bet be- in a better future. Absolutely. Nice. Like, mm. I could tell like uh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Mm. That's... But as a, as an athlete, it's hard to say, but yeah. you for sure going to have a better life and a longer life and, and a better person and a better developed person, even on and off the field. Yes, if you go, if you do that path. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. And it sounds like you have no regrets for that at all. And you were very accomplished in both fields and were able to succeed in many mediums in life. So it sounds like there's no regrets. And for anyone who might be debating, you know, a similar path to Pablo in, in that regard, if they're coming out of high school or if they're around, you know, eighteen, seventeen, nineteen and they're looking at that path, just take it from Pablo. Things can work out really well for you, regardless in both ways, like you said. And sometimes the balance is needed and it's better. Now we need to move on to your college experience, like you were talking about earlier. You said we're going to get into that later. So we want to dive into that. You went to Oklahoma Baptist. If I, it, it, correct, yes. I, I believe, I, I know we've talked, for people who are wondering, me and Pablo have known each other for quite a while. Actually, Max known Pablo as well. Mm-hmm. So he's sort of a friend of ours. Um, and when we've talked before, you said um, that you went to Oklahoma Baptist and then you transferred or, or something like that later on. And you also played some uh, PDL during your college experience. Yes. So for a lot mm-hmm. of people wondering um, about that college experience, could you just describe that, the different teams you played on and how you had to balance everything? Yes. So after we signed, uh, I got this divide. I played the tryouts. I got invited to, and uh, he got a uh, um, the scholarship. So they send they send you an I twenty for for those that are there when I come here. You receive the I twenty with with your scholarship. Everything that's that uh the the college will charge you, and everything that they're not gonna charge you. Um. So when I got to Oklahoma Baptist, I was like, oh. I got to the city that um, didn't have much to do. I think the highlight of my weekend, I, I think I told Leo, I was like going to Walmart. I was dressed up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm experiencing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. And everything that we did was in, you know, uh, uh, on campus. But the thing is, for me, it was great. I mean, you're American, so you're used to everything that you're seeing right now. But for me, coming from Brazil, everything was different. And the language was different, and like uh, you know, the the food was different, people were different. So for me, it was a very uh, learning experience. So I didn't have I didn't have time or didn't care about what's going on outside of the college, because because I had too much to do. I had too much to learn. I had to learn English in six months to 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 actually start with in college because I took the ESL classes. ESL is a uh, English second language. I still need to take some of the classes, but now I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> uh, so it, and it was interesting because every single, I mean, every, every, every game that we play, the, the announcer would be from Brazil, number two, and you say their, their name, number three from Brazil. We had nine, nine Brazilians. Really? Uh, wow. As, Quick question as then. As Did your coach recruit all of them from that uh, camp that he had? No, but some. Okay. Some of them. Yeah, but there are a lot of like from different different states and different uh, places. Um, and we had nine. So it was the first time the college went to the national. So, so we went to Daytona, Daytona Beach. And yeah, it was a very uh, fun experience. And, but, you know, I, I knew that my first year will be great there, but my second year when everything that I have seen and I have learned, so I, I need to move on. Um, and so when we finished the season, I started talking to people and uh, and I started talking to a um, college in California and I talked to the coach and he was friend of the Pacific. I, tra- I talked to the coach and he said, probably I'm so sorry. I really, you know, uh, really when I tried to take you here, but for me, it's kind of hard because we don't have a lot of scholarship available right now. It's like, okay, no problem. So I contacted a, a, a college, another college, Azusa Pacific. It was, um, it's like, uh, a little south from, from Fresno, Fresno Pacific. And I said, coach, do you remember me? We play against, uh, when I was playing for a Baptist and, and that game was four, four, two. And I scored the two. Mm-hmm. And he goes, oh, of course I remember Pablo, and I I think you were one of the best the best strikers that I haven't seen. Blah blah blah, and send that email. So I got that email, forwarded to the coach at a friend of Pacific. Let's see if he see me different now. So I forwarded the email to the guy. He goes, no, Pablo, now we have scholarship. We're gonna fight. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> if, if if you we don't have, we we you know we're gonna do some. We're wow. gonna sell something. We're gonna <laughs> make some. I don't know. So. 
uh, scholarship just a you know start start appearing from out of the blue. But yeah, so it was good because I went there, and he when I got there, he was the coach of the first uh, Fresno Pacific, the college, and he was also the coach of Fresno Fuego, which was the PDL of the of the city. And they play in a baseball stadium that could hold like five, six thousand people. Like everybody followed. And, and in order to to see how much they followed, Fresno Fuego now it's a USL team. Yep. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's how much that's how much they care and how much they love that team. He carried it on. Mm-hmm. But at that time it was a PDL and it was great because I could play and not lose my eligibility. And while everybody else would go home and I'll stay there. I'll, I'll I'll be working and I'll be playing for Fresno Fuego, and eventually the the coach of my coach of the Fresno Pacific I was was replaced, um, and another uh, coach came, and that coach had a, a company that he hired me to to work with. So and during my summer summertime I was working in the morning afternoon and I was practicing or playing at night. So it was a great scenario, and eventually I would get so tired to work the next day after a game, you know. And, and one time, one time the lunch time, everybody went to eat lunch, and I kind of like put my head down on the table and uh, <laughs> fell asleep. Nobody, <laughs> At the so lunch table. Wo- yes. <laughs> everybody left to go to work, and they left me there. No. So what? The the coach boss. My coach, my and also my boss came in and like, Pablo, why are you sleeping? Like, sorry, coach, I was so tired, I, I didn't even see it. And he went outside, started screaming at everybody, not at me. I was like, oh, what happened here? <laughs> so later, later on, I found out like, okay, he was sleepy, but nobody woke him up. So why you guys didn't wake him up? You, you kidding me? Blah blah blah. And eventually, like the guys, like, oh, I know, but you know. You know, Pablo. We, I think he probably was tired. So you're, they they treat me as a, as a, you know, athlete. They will go to games. So it was like a very nice um, relationship. It yeah. wasn't something like it, it wasn't malicious at all. He was. They just wanted me to to rest. You know, mm-hmm. but and it was it was a great year because that uh, and we had a great team too. It was like some Brazilian players that played with me um, and. Chivas, Chivas uh, from MLS at the time. Now they they folded. Went there and they lost three to one to our team. That's really? how good it was. Wow. Yeah, I I've seen actually some some well like it wouldn't be like Chivas because they folded, but some Liga MX teams have actually gone and played some MPSL or USL two teams and stuff like that. And it's like a really big event. I saw that there was a team in. Uh, I think it was Indiana that I saw did that. Um, I was so surprised, but I guess that happens more often than I thought. No, yeah, but you're talking about USL. We were a PDL. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Yes, that that was, and we played against Galaxy, against Donovan. And wow, really? San Jose, yeah, San Jose will go there. So it was like very, very good. And that, and then when we played Galaxy, Donovan was on the team, and after he. Uh, a radio went to interview him. He goes, like, yeah, very nice to come here. We're, we're experienced. We're in preseason. We really like the number nine. The tall guy. No way. He said that about wow. you. He said that on the Landon radio. Landon said and that, that. And that's what wow. everything started. But if if everything that we talk about, we talk about funny story, I'll talk. Let's, let's tell one about that one. <laughs> so when I got to the team, uh, when switch from my coach to the other coach, which that that's the the coach I, I will play and work for later on, he didn't know me. So when I got there, tall guy, he goes, "Oh, that will be my defender." So first practice, <laughs> he played me as a defender. I was like, "Hmm, interesting," <laughs> and I didn't say anything, and was probably was one of my first. Uh, Teach my first learning in 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 life. Um, I I'm not gonna say anything. I'm gonna practice. 
for sure I tackle everyone uh, that tried to go past me just so he never put me there again. But I didn't say anything to him. And eventually he he started to understand. But I understood why he did that at first because he didn't know me. And there was a guy that was playing up top, the number and I call Maradona. Diego? <laughs> Diego. <laughs> his, his, his nickname was Maradona. He was a lefty guy, very skillful. What a nickname. Our, yeah. yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be complaining if I had that nickname. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Hello. laughs> well, yeah. yeah, but so you have an idea. They had, they, he has that name because he played like him, very skillful, very scored a lot of goals. So when I came here, tall guy, you know, a little discoordinator, he, he thought I was like, oh, that's going to be my number three. Uh, play going to play as a defender. <laughs> So at, at the beginning, it was like that, like, okay, not sure about Pablo and stuff. And so I was like, no worries. And that's why I, that was my first um, lesson was because if I fought with them and say something in the first practice, nothing after that would have had happened. Yeah. You know, so, and then that's what you're going to understand. First, you absorb, first, you, you see it. First, you deserve the respect, and then you ask for it. Not like all the way around. Mm -hmm. So it was my first lesson that nobody knew me, nobody saw me play, and there's there's no way of asking for respect if I never actually deserved it. So I first let let's do something. So at the at the games went on, and every time that Diego went to the Diego no, Maradona went to play, he scored a goal. I was like, okay, when he put me on, I'm going to score a goal too. So he put me on, score a goal. So one goal for Maradona, one goal for Pele. <laughs> so <laughs> We've given him the for, name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it will go for Pablo. And then the second game, he goes, oh man, he's starting him again. So if I get in, I have to score more than him. So Maradona will score a goal. I'll get him to go and score two goals. The next, the next game didn't pull me he's like okay now maradona not gonna score and i'm gonna score it's this is exactly what happened he didn't score he put me on the score and from that point on i never um got off the, the he always put me and started me and eventually maradona never went to practice anymore because he probably understood that okay i think it it's time for uh for me to go because pop is gonna be playing over me and he's not going to accept to be on the bench. So he didn't go. So, but that the first lesson was if, if I said something fought at, the, at, at the beginning, that wouldn't have happened. And I will kind of cut short my opportunities that I had. So yeah. I, yeah, I end up, I am up playing, scoring, I think 20, 21 goals. I, I was the MVP and a golden boot so of, of the year. And that's what got me a lot of attention. So at the time, uh, MLS teams, they didn't have a lot of uh, assistant coach that would travel. So normally, like, head coaches would, would go watch your games back in the days. Now they have scouters. Now they have assistant coaches that travel. But back in the days, it was straight head, head coach. And one time, the head coach went to watch my game. And we were in the semifinal was from Pacific, I don't remember the other team. It was like very hot in the Saturday morning. I was playing okay. But my friend came to me probably like in the 20th minute of the game. He goes, Pop, do you know there's a MLS coach came to watch you play? I was like, oh, there is? Yeah, no, there is. He came actually, the head coach came to watch you. I was like, oh. And I was... I was joke with Leo and I, I go like here, <laughs> put like, okay, I need to put like. 80, People don't 80%. understand how, how much that haunts me now. Every time me and Pablo <laughs> would ever play, well, what it's called, futebol in Brazil, but it's it's like uh, soccer, volleyball, foot, foot volley is sort of what it is. Every single time I play Pablo, if I start winning, he just cranks up a knob in his chest. I don't even know how it works and I don't win. Like it's just, it's guaranteed. It's crazy. Yeah. So I kind of like, okay, I need to start doing better, you know, push more. And then I start, I start running, tackle people and I scored the winning goal. So after, after the match, 
he came to talk to me and, and with the field was a little bit away from the college. So we actually walked back together and he was explaining uh, how much he, he liked me and how much he wanted me to pay for him. And us. but we are, we're in a conversation that was at the end of the year, uh, I think November, December. And I kind of like, uh, accepted the, uh, he, he sent me an offer, but I kind of like couldn't do it, um, at that time because I was going to school and I promised my parents that I actually would not leave school and for the, for the, for the opportunity and the Love offer day, yes, for the opportunity and the, and the, and the, you know, the, the, the offer they sent me, I was like, no, it's, it's not worth it to go yet. So I stay one more year. So I uh, came back in January. I start playing for Fuego again and during the summer. And I was the leading scorer of the PDO again. That's so, crazy. That like I think people need to understand how insane that stat is. The PDL is a national league, or it was. Now it's the same as USL two for any nerds who know, like myself, who know a lot about the <laughs> US soccer league system. But the USL two, which is like the fourth tier, is basically what the PDL was. And Pablo was the leading scorer of the whole league. Not like just the conference, but the whole league twice. Like that's insane. Mm. Crazy, Pablo. Just so much respect for that. Oh, thank you. But the thing is, and I was trying to um, to, t- to stay in college, but a uh, Swedish team came and offered me a contract and actually bought me. I was like, okay. I don't think I can actually say no to that. Yeah. So I ended up leaving to play in Sweden. Man, great experience. I went to Europe and adapt so quickly because like there, the 98% of people speak English more than United States. It's kind of funny. But (laughs) here, people, yeah, people here speak Spanish. No way. Yeah. More people. That's crazy. What? Yeah, because some people live here, they only speak Spanish. Yeah, uh, and everyone, true. like pretty much everyone there just speaks English or speaks both, like Swedish and yeah. English. Everybody knows English. Hmm. It's crazy. Wow, crazy. So you Did went you, there, though. Yeah. yeah, I played there. But but the thing is when, but I actually uh, left in the middle of PDL, so I kind of like didn't finish the season. So I... I think somebody passed me in goals because I couldn't play the last, I don't know how many goals, uh, games I, I had still. But um, I played there. So when I came back, MLS saw me with different eyes. They saw me, okay, now he's not coming from college, he's coming from Europe. So they kind of like uh, offered me a better deal. And I was like, oh, that's, that's way better. And I didn't know which club they I would end up with because they did a lottery because there's more than two clubs, I think four or five that wanted to to sign me. And in the lottery, I ended up playing for some of their earthquakes. And that's where I started I start, I, I came back for and I started playing for them in San Jose. Uh, great experience. We met with great players, but mid-season. I went to practice and the guy's like, uh, Pablo, you don't have to change your clothes. I was like, why? Because he got traded. It's like, got traded? Yeah, they tell me at practice. And he goes, yeah, you have to um, go to Utah, Salt Lake City. And guess, guess who was the coach that was watching me in that college game? The Real Salt Lake. The Real Salt Lake coach, yeah. Yep. Jason it all Price. comes full circle. <laughs> all come full circle. And to understand that uh, statement was, imagine if I fought with the coach first time they put me as a defender. Yeah. Wow. Imagine. You know, there's this documentaries or this uh, series that you watch, and it changes the whatever you do in the past, changes your future, and kind of can see it. There's a one called Dark. So whoever you do it, did in the past, it's gonna change your future. And I think that's exactly what my it's true. You know the the episode mm-hmm. would will be. So that that first episode would change the episode seven. 
So my episode seven will be different if I change the episode one with my playing as a defender. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, did you – so you talked about how moving – playing in Sweden for a little bit definitely brought more eyes to you and more respect towards you as a player. But did you yourself feel like the level of competition in Sweden was that much better than where you are playing in the U.S.? Or was it more just the reputation of playing in Europe that got you um, those offers for MLS teams? Yeah, no, the – you know, the – Sweden is like the second tier of uh, Europe. So you play well in Sweden, uh, you know, a bigger team is going to come and buy you. So uh, the competition was was very, very, very good. So coming from a a college to play uh, in Swedish league, it was it's way different. And There's that was a lot first of, division, yeah? Yeah. First, Crazy. yeah. So, so cool. So, yeah, there – yeah, there is a, a a lot of differences and like money wise is like ridiculous. There's a lot of money in, in Sweden. So normally when you wanna uh, make sure a, a a player wants to prove themselves and they wanna move to the next to the next uh team, they if they do well in the Swedish league, they they for sure gonna be bought yeah. by a big team, big club. Definitely. Yeah. I have a sort of a question about uh, this being your first like real big professional experience. And it's in a really big hotbed for football. I mean, you're playing in Europe. So you're in first division, you're in Europe, you're in the Swedish first division, which is another big league, right? I mean, they're sending teams to the Champions League. So like this is this is real stuff here, um, like super tangible, like players that you watch on TV, like stuff like that. And, and you're, you're in a tangible position where you can like touch that and feel that and play in that. It's crazy. But did you notice, I know you said there's a lot of money that is sort of involved in, and that starts to affect the game, especially coming from the U S where there's not as much money in the game and also coming from PDL and college where there's like no money in the game almost, um, still a little bit, but almost none. Did you sort of get shocked with how much that changed the game? And also, did you notice that people's egos started to take control over them? I've always wanted to ask uh, people this and, and figure this out, but does that really change when you get to the higher levels and, and when more money is involved? Do people start to build bigger egos and, and sort of cut other people out and think that they're the, they're the best and they deserve the attention and they deserve the respect? Or... Is it less than people may imagine? Is it still more of a team mentality and culture? Yeah, there's a there's a big uh, there's a big change, and because now it's people's job, and people like really like you know it, it's their living. It's, yeah, it's it, for sure. Like when in college, you you're playing for something, but yeah, it's different than when you're playing for a career and from playing for a lot of money. That that changes a lot, and the and the and the ego, I, I would say ego we have everywhere. If you go yeah. to play, you know, work for Amazon, you for sure in your in your team you're gonna see a lot of you gotta be like social intel you gotta be you have a little bit of your social intelligence involved. But in in sports the it's a little it's a big factor because you have to perform every week or maybe perform twice a week. And if you don't do it, somebody gonna take your spot are you gonna be traded are you gonna be it's a lot of money involved so the yeah egos are it, it is a thing and nowadays a, a good coach will it'd be more important if you know how to manage 32 players because now if you don't know how to manage their egos or their what they want and how they want and how they want it to be treated you kind of like lose your locker room so it's yeah. very, very important, very important how you treat your players, how you talk to your players. And back in the days, we we had this. They they didn't have the social media. They didn't have you know the, this Instagram, TikTok. So now it's a, even two more, three more things that you have to to deal with that you didn't have to deal with uh, uh, back in the days. So now like, there. I think the coaches and everybody that works with it and even the players have to adapt to this kind of like format and the, the big factors that get in your locker room, you know, they can, mm -hmm. they can either, either take your team to the next level or can actually destroy your, your locker room. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes 
it's sort of unique to the MLS, I feel like, and how, like you said, you didn't even know, but then you just got traded out of nowhere. And that's kind of how the league works, it seems, compared to ones in Europe. But you did get traded to Real Salt Lake, which was probably one of the best teams in the MLS at that time. Um, and as a very successful team, I kind of I'm wondering um, what you saw in terms of t- team culture and how that was different from other teams you played in, because since the team you were playing in for Real Salt Lake was winning, I think, a lot of games and they're very successful. Obviously, they won MLS Cup um, in 2009. But what was the team culture like? And did you see a real difference in intensity or togetherness because it was such a successful team on the pitch? Um, so I think the difference was uh, Jason Kras and the assistant coach, which is they 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 were phenomenal. Jeff uh, was from uh, Fraser was phenomenal. Now Fraser is the head coach of Colorado, so he was my oh, assistant yeah. coach at the time. He he was those guys were like uh, amazing. They made a family, and I think sometimes that was more like a lot of bunch of individuals. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time and when i got it real salt lake i was like and and to be honest they are not very good at that time they are we, we no we were very good but they are not doing very well in terms of result results mm-hmm. uh we were we we're the last team to qualify so at that time we qualified uh we could qualify eight eight teams now it's seven uh from each um west and east uh, at that time it was eight and we actually needed some results and we needed to i uh, think it was seattle to lose and when i got there i scored back-to-back goals and we won in kansas city that we never won before and i score in i think it was against she was at home and then we played the next one in kansas city so i scored both winning goals um that ha- has not happened before either so when I got there, it was like very every everything clicked very very well, um, and I yeah. So I think it was Seattle needed to lose something or there was us to qualify, and that is exactly what happened. We won the games that we needed to win, and uh, I think Seattle didn't win, so we qualified in eighth place, uh, which was like oh. And we were in the underdogs because they were not supposed to be there. And then we actually qualified. So we were underdogs of the playoffs. And every time that we play, we play as an underdog. Like, okay, that's going to be a beatable team. Go there and beat. But then we came with the result. Second one, came with another result. Tech, the, the, the other one was came with another result. And when I got like back and scored back to back, when he goes, we had the, the player of the year, the, the week. And it was between me and uh, Beckham. Really? So I was like, okay, if it was for, for beauty, I think I will win. But if it was for being a better player, Beckham will win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I just, and it was funny enough. And I, I, I won player of the, the week at that, that time. So that transition again, when, and I think again, I mean, I was supposed to be the whole year at San Jose. At the middle of the year, it changed to uh, Real Salt Lake. So I think everything that I, everything that I've been to, there is a change at the beginning to uh, a better thing. You know, I think you guys saw. It. So uh, first, a Guarani, I was supposed to be in Ponte Preto, I went to Guarani. The second one, I was supposed to go to Flamengo, I went to Botafogo. And now I was supposed to be at San Jose, I went to Real Salt Lake. Yeah. So there's a there's kind of like a, a pattern there, and every time mm-hmm. every change it was for for better. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge so, pattern in your career. I mean, we see it like throughout the whole time, just the perseverance and the resilience to not let those changes like beat you down and drag you down and, and keep your head held high. I mean, I I know Mac talked about it a little bit and how it's really prevalent in the MLS, but. If I were in your shoes, I definitely wouldn't have handled it as well. Going to training, expecting to train, and then just be told, being told, like you're you're moving, like you're you're just leaving this <laughs> this whole state. You're you're leaving, and you're moving to Utah. I'd be like, what's going on right now? Like I don't have any say in this. Like that's weird, but it's it's an incredible sense of perseverance and resilience and um, 
just you continuing to to move forward and and you're getting the results that that sort of show that. Um, I I want to ask you about the specific day. I think a lot of people want to hear this um, so that they can sort of envision it. It's probably hard to envision if you haven't lived through it, but we're going to try to see if me and Mac can, um, <laughs> because I can imagine it's probably surreal. But could you walk us through the MLS Cup final and that sort of day, the, the time leading up to it? Uh, the time leading it to, to the game? Yeah, so sort of like everything leading up to the game and then like what the experience was like playing the game and then the celebrations. I just, I can imagine it was a very tense and intense time and and part of your career. And then I can imagine that the celebrations afterwards were <laughs> not not only tense and intense, but also immense. I'm, I'm throwing all the answers out there, the ends, but, yeah. but but they, <laughs> they belong because I, I, I'd imagine it was an incredible day. So if you could yeah. just like tell, because like, you know, not many people who, who live on this planet get to experience something so cool and, and surreal like that. So if you could just like sort of walk us through so we can try and envision what it would be like to, to sort of have that moment. Um, yeah, so, you know, under, to understand, uh, it was the, the game was in Seattle and my whole family lived in Seattle. So that was a place that I was very familiar with and I had my whole family there. So it's kind of, it's even, I think there will be there any, I mean, any place that we play, but when you play at, you know, the, the city that your family lives is, is different. Mm-hmm. So oh, lead up to it, it's like everything is different. When you practice, there's a lot of tension. There's like camera and you, like every the whole gear change. They put MLS Cup and um, there's a schedule for for a different schedule for everyone. There's a, a lot of in, interviews for everyone. So leading up to it is like a lot of tension and a lot of you know people talk a lot about it. So a lot of a lot of uh, um, the media with, uh, you know, training and to dealing with, you know, coaches, uh, trying to make everybody calm and to, to, you know, stick to our, our plan. And so everything is, it's, there's a sensation and something's different, which is like the same as another game. But when you, you put a, the importance that it was, it changes, it changes the, the, the scenario and the, and the game as well. So, and that's why we talk about like the mental side, because this is our mental. That's supposed to be, you know, 11 against 11, that's 90 minutes. But because there's some factors and some, some, uh, uh, I mean, outside factors that change the whole thing. But if you don't change anything inside you, did it change at all? No. Yeah. But so that's why I, 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 I tell you guys like how important it is, how, how much you work with your mind, how much, what the voice, the voice that you have inside your mind, how much it affects you, how much that takes you down or bring you up. What, 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 what does the voice tell you? They tell you, does it tell you that you're not capable? It tells you that you're very good. You're going to be able to do it. How, how are you going to turn that to a, to something that is going to be, you know, in your advance. But, and when we play the game, we play against Beckham and Donovan. So there's another thing like people are saying, <laughs> yeah, people are saying it, it, it's already it's already done. They're gonna win. They have Bo Donovan and Beckham. They have they have the best team. They're they're a galaxy. So there's also that there's this like doubt doubts that they they want you to believe, you know. But I don't know. But if if you know, if you, you have seen our team, our team were like. We were very good individuals and also a very good team. We we play as a team, but if you like point it out individually, they had a, like great great players. So I think that's what it came to, and and we went to PKs, and you know that tension and every PK is like it, it's either the the end of the the beginning of the celebrations, and after you had the last one, you start running and hugging your friends, and after. As you see on the, on the field, that everybody gets in the field, and your family gets with you, and you take pictures, and you grab the you grab the trophy, and you know all this sensation. Like, oh man, how how long did it, did it take me to actually be here? That you know, from from like getting 
uh, waiting too much, too long in a, in a room that I mean, people never showed up to change another team to going to to Rio to go into Oklahoma and then going to uh, California. It's, it's so long until everything happens. It's like it's not like you know actually making a cake. It it takes a lot of hours and a lot of changes and a lot of uh, a lot of things to to make that happen. Yeah, I'd I'd imagine it's it's really hard in the moment to to sort of fully understand the amount of work that went into to building to that moment, to that experience in your career. And and it's just it's crazy. I bet it took you a while to really understand and fully compact what just happened in your life and to fully appreciate it. I mean I know now you you probably look back on that moment with with tons of nostalgia and, and fond memories, but in the moment it was probably just craziness, like like unreal. I, I mean, me and Mac, we played on the same high school team. We won our conference championship, <laughs> and and on the day that we won our conference championship, it was craziness. Like it was happy, but it was also just all over the place. Now I can look back on it with with nostalgia, um, yeah. but on the day it was like just a little bit of craziness and. Um, and I can't imagine how much that would be multiplied if it was in the MLS Cup final. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. mean, just a- exponentially higher. Um, but eventually, you were able to to de decompact all of that, you know, like fi- figure everything out um, and and whatnot, and really understand what just happened. And you were able to move with your career. Luckily, you were able to move with your career and move <laughs> to another phase where you had tons of success too. Now, this phase, it's not entirely in Minnesota, but it was partially in Minnesota. So me and Mac have really fond memories of this phase because we are both, as many of the fans of the podcast know, we are both fans of Minnesota United. And you were one of our very own players and you played fantastic here. So could you take us through the journey that you had in the NASL, starting with the San Antonio Scorpions, leading through to Minnesota United, and then finishing in Miami, where you sort of finished out your career. We know there was some injuries scattered here and there, if you want to touch on those. Um, but just to like show sort of how your career finished up through the NASL, where you had tons of success as well. Yes. Um, so in San Antonio was probably one of the best years that I, that I had, and they also started in the first team. Which it was for me it was great because everybody uh, was we came at the same level like yeah. we yeah we didn't get ahead there with like oh there's this player that has been here for seven years that's the player that you know it's uh, uh, very famous and we got to respect his history no we got there everybody was the same so we we kind of like form a very good team and through that through that year we. Started, started pretty well and and I don't know I was very very much uh, in, in shape and you know I was working and the thing that one of the things that really got uh, into me when I was real Lake was work on the finishing because Jason Kreis was he was a striker you know he scored like 100 plus goals for MLS so he made sure that we were you know, practicing and finishing over and over and over, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. So we doing like two or three times a week and doing a lot of repetitions. So I think that actually got up to me when, when I, uh, after that experience, and when, so when I got in uh, at San Antonio, like I, everything clicked, everything clicked. We, and we, we play against MLS teams. We did well as well. And, and I started scoring scoring goals, and that year ended up being the the golden uh, the, the golden boot and the MVP of the league. And actually, I broke the record of the most goals scored in a year. So it was, mm. I think, it was Romario's record. Wow! Really? I see here it says twenty goals, eight assists. I think we pulled that from transfer market. Is that correct? Yes, and uh, that was twenty one plus the going uh, playoffs. Oh playoffs, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that count. unreal that numbers. Count. Yeah, for yeah. regular season, um, mm-hmm. that's un- that's unreal. Yeah, that's numbers. crazy. I mean, craziness. And you said you broke Romario's record. It's insane. Yeah, he was. I think he was 18. Really? 
So uh, Romario is Brazilian, yeah? Yeah. So how did it feel breaking a record <laughs> of a huge, very famous player who came out of your home country? Man, you know, if if you see his career, he's probably one of the best ever. He's not even like Brazilian. He's like one of the best in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They yeah. won a World Cup and yeah, it was insane. It was so what insane. did that feel like? You know, you're just like, oh yeah, I just casually, you know. I beat Romario's record, like it's fine. But now I move to the next part of my career. <laughs> well, but I think at that at that age he had 20, 20 goals for Barcelona. So that's <laughs> yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. We don't talk about that part of it. <laughs> <laughs> not not much to be like, oh Romario. No, he was a little like a little older. But yeah. yeah, no, it was it, yeah, it was a great year. And even even like I think uh coming as came to 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 San Antonio at that time he he probably was the top leading scorer for MLS at that time and he even the interview goes well Bob we got I had a probably four fifteen goals he goes yeah four fifteen goals in any league I think it's is already amazing you know so in coming from him was like uh, it was amazing because he yeah he, yeah he he went on my spot but. <laughs> There, yeah. there isn't even like in, in games uh, we we have like uh, some signs they they would say Pablo Campos is your nightmare. So they, <laughs> they, yeah, they put in the in the games. It was it was very fun. Are, do you do you go into like seasons maybe that season or just any season in your career um, with a goal set like oh I'm gonna break the goal scoring record or I have this many goals that I want to get to this many assists. Do you have those that you kind of write down or is it all more as you go, you just push yourself for each game? No, well, if, if, if for sure, if I'm, no, I wasn't looking for to be the goal scorer, I would be lying because every, after every game, I would check the stats of everyone. Mm -hmm. It was that, that how crazy it was, especially in uh, PDL and college. Um, it, it was crazy because later on, I, I went to play, I went to a showcase and there was this guy that used to compete with me and I didn't know. Like, Pop, I used to try to beat you in every game. I tried to go past your numbers, but you were always like, I had. But, and I was always checking, like, who scored, uh, who scored, how many goals they scored, how many goals they have. Mm -hmm. And I was like that crazy about, about numbers and stats. And it was even funny to, to talk to this guy because he was, competing I, I didn't even know but yeah people yeah. were on the other people you, you never know what other people are doing on the other side but they were they were checking they were like and they said they said he remembers me because i was always fighting for to be the in the top you know so yeah i i didn't have a, a number but i was always fighting and looking for and to be at the top of the the stats yeah nice unreal mm-hmm um, do you, so you obviously have that great season with, um, San Antonio, but then you move to Minnesota, our which club, is our home club, our, our Vamos favorite, yeah. yeah, you're an absolute legend for the club. And I, the one memory I have, I don't know if Leo remembers this, but I was at a game and you scored and then your celebration was running up the stairs and then you sat down in the, with the fans in the stands and started clapping and it was just an incredible celebration. I'm wondering how you thought of that and if that was planned out at all or if that was just in the moment you're like, I'm going to go do this. I'm still waiting it for it to be added to FIFA. Pablo, you yeah. need to get this going. Great, great celebration <laughs> for FIFA. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay now another funny, as I'm doing every everything a part of the, the podcast, I'm doing a funny story. I'm going to tell that one too. <laughs> So yeah, it was a ball, a long ball. The guy headed back, I think, was Christian Christian Amrides, and I put the first first time in in the air. I scored the goal. I went to the to the stands and I sat by the guy, and he goes, "What are you doing here?" I say, like, "Oh, you think I'm gonna miss that goal? I need to watch it." <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so wow. yeah, I went to I went there to watch my goal. Nice. Well, everybody everybody was laughing. So, yeah. No. It was not playing at all, no. Wow. It's legendary, though. It's one <laughs> it of the is, best celebrations is. I've ever seen. Like, yeah. I'm not even kidding. You could probably pull up, like, top 10 celebrations ever. 
and I could slide yours in there and I don't think people would notice. Like, I'm not kidding at all. I don't think people, if, if I made a compilation video of like, you know, the the celebration at the World Cup 2010 where they did like the dance, you know, and then they mm-hmm. expanded yeah. around and all that. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that they would like blink <laughs> or, or bat an eye if they saw that if video and then there, yeah. Pablo sitting down clapping and then another video from like the World Cup, they wouldn't notice. It's just that good. Like, I, I'm not even kidding. It was an unreal celebration. So big respect for pulling that one out. I think that goes back to the amount of self-respect you have. And, you know, like you were talking at the beginning of the video, how you need to have that confidence confidence and self-respect in order to succeed in your career and you're willing to go go the extra mile to make your celebration look good and I respect that and I love that um so that sort of concludes you finished uh well then then you had an, actually I, I think before we get into the quick fires we should touch on you did have an injury correct so we should probably touch on that for anyone who might have sustained an injury recently or or has had to go through that process uh just so that Pablo can kind of explain what that was like and then what the rehab process was like yeah, in 2014, we went to uh, England to uh, for preseason, um, and we play. I think Manchester, Manchester United or Manchester City, and one uh, one kid actually tackled me from behind, and I had a, uh, I you know, tore my ACL, um, and then I went came back to the United States, and I actually had to go through to the which doctor I'm gonna get um, uh, surgery with, and I had a interview with one, and I said no, I. I I prefer to see another guy. I went to the second one. So no, I prefer to see the third guy. The third guy was, and he got in the room. Was like, okay, that's that's him. Papa didn't say a word. No, no, I know it's you. And it was actually Leo's dad, <laughs> which is um, and and I knew before he actually talked. So that was the the funny part that uh that connected us, and we are now we are. Uh, you know, very close, great friend, friends, and we uh, we talk a lot. But at that time, I didn't know him obviously, and kind of like I knew that he was going to going to be a very not that the other two were not they were bad. It just didn't click at the time. So it was a very su- successful uh, surgery, and I went to rehab in Brazil because uh, I know they're a little bit. In, in a way, they get they get away from the pro- protocol. And here, um, if you get you know get out of the protocol, you, you can get a lot in trouble. And but I knew because if I do like quick, if I do quicker, if I go to Brazil and do quicker, I could come back and play in the same season, which like not a lot of people believe. But I said no, I'm gonna come back to play because I got her. The season will be February March. I got surgery and then. Six months later, I was on the field. Exactly six months. So it was very good rehab. It's and really after good recovery. Months, yeah. Yes. When I got in Brazil and they checked my knee, say, Pablo, you are one month behind. I said, just so you know, I had a, my surgery a month ago. How is that possible? <laughs> I'm a month behind. <laughs> he goes, yeah, it looks like you just got out of the surgery. That, that's what he did. It's like, oh. So he kind of like in two or three months, he could push me a lot and and kind of like put me uh, up to date. And in three, mu- in three months, I was doing like rehab on sand. And I sent you went back that to Brazil to, for that, right? Yeah, I went to Brazil. And mm-hmm. I sent, I, I sent you, uh, the, the videos to, to Christopher. It was like, wait, is that Pablo? Is that, is that video from today? It was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he couldn't believe that I could actually run and on on sand and touch the ball in three months like oh my god and then in six months i was on the field again which was um it was a i think it was a playoff game and then we went to pk and i had to go take a pk so we were walking from the middle of the, the field into the pk spot and you know that whole story everything flashed through my mind and i was like how much i much it took me to to go back and, and play another game it was uh it was very good and i i made my mom was in on the stadium so i i luckily i actually you know actually score because imagine oh six months to miss the pk <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i wish i wish it wasn't that quick in brazil 
<laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, everything worked out. And the next season, I, I came back, started scoring a lot of goals. So it was, it was, it was pretty good. Nice. nice. Yeah. I mean, it, the the rehab process, the injury process for all players, you know, it's tough. Um, Pablo can relate to that. I, I've never had like a long sustained injury like that, Mac. I know you haven't either, but we can obviously relate to, I mean, even when I'm out for like two weeks, I'm like, this is the worst. This is like, I hate this. <clears throat> so I can't yes. imagine six yes. months and even, even, you know, people telling you that it, it should be longer. It's going to be longer than six months. It's got to be a grueling process that it just takes a lot out of you to go through. No, for sure. Because uh, in Brazil, I was going to rehab in the morning. I'll go eat. I'll go back in the afternoon. Yeah. That for three, four months. And yeah. it's a lot of repetition. And people are people are playing on the field. And they're and some people are like, oh, we we're missing Pablo. Where's Pablo? You know, like those are the things that are, they're very hard on you and you cannot do what you used to do and you cannot run, you cannot play and you have to do over and over and over, you know, a lot of strengthening, a lot of strengthening. For sure. It helps you to be a better person and take care of your body more and, and know that you need, you really need to, to do the, the things before it happens. So you actually don't, you don't get hurt that serious. But yeah. sometimes, Sometimes even if you do, and depends how the guy tackles it, it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna actually prevent from you, you know, to, to uh, tear your your uh, ligament. Yeah, but so, sometimes it, you can't do anything. It, no, sometimes you can't. But if you if you really do, you're gonna for sure, you know, de uh, decrease the the percentage of getting hurt. But it it is very it's very frustrating for six seven months and. It, it, again, it goes back to how strong you are mentally, how much, how, what the voice tells you. It, it, it's a positive voice. It's a negative voice. It, do you actually bring the good things, not the bad things? And, and also, and they're in Bud Buddhism, they say every end, it's a new beginning. So I think that's, that's how you should, you know, take your, your, your life with. If there's something close here, that's another door that's going to open somewhere or someplace else or for another opportunity. You got to always believe that you close a phase and you start another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, every end is a new beginning. I love that, that sort of way that you described your career and also life. You know, you can take that into your life in sort of all areas. We do have a couple random questions that we talked to you about before the podcast. So we did just have our end of our main section, and now we have a new beginning. See, it's even translating to the podcast. Oh, wow, wow nice. look at that. Already nice. applying it. Yeah. Hey, but we, we, can't we have, wait. Yeah? Can't wait to hear my new beginning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Your, new, your new beginning's going to be great. Are, are you ready? Yeah. We have three yeah. random questions. Me and Mac are each going to ask, and we're just going to bounce off each other. Um, and then after that, we have two closing questions. So I'll just start us off. With this one, it's sort of quick fire. You can take a little bit to answer it, but this is sort of just like what comes to your head first, right? So what is your go-to pregame meal? Uh, yeah, well, I would go with uh, all the meals that we used to eat. It's uh, pasta, which like it, it's good for everyone. And also you can digest really quick. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Uh, okay. Secondly is your favorite cleats of all time that you wore. Oh man, I actually had uh the one I loved was the uh, Puma, the King. Puma they Kings. Oh, nice. Class, yeah. class. It Those are great the Pele, cleats. The Pele ones. They yeah. like, stopped making them. I was like, are you guys kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing Mizuno's right now because they're never going to stop making them. I think they've made the exact same cleat for the last 50 years and they're never going to stop. So, I'm right. wearing Mizuno's. <laughs> like like Adidas the 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 Copa yeah, the yeah, Copa yeah, the Copas, yep. yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're just good cleats. There's, if it's not broke, don't try and fix it. They're good cleats. Like, there's yeah. no need. But yeah, those Puma Kings were great. The last one is the favorite or your favorite stadium that you've ever played in. That could be atmosphere, size, uh, like the this type of stadium, the pitch. Like structure and stuff, pitch. It's just like whatever you feel like was the best experience playing in a stadium. Okay, so we had a rivalry in Sweden, um, Gaz, 
And the stadium we we have forty five thousand people. Wow! Jeez. You cannot, Was that your stadium? They they had the our stadium, and we have the stadium that we play against the the rivals. Wow! And, and man, you cannot hear the guy by you. You yeah. cannot hear it. It's so loud that sometimes you don't even you know don't even hear like the whistle. It is crazy. Uh, I always play Maracanã, one of the used to be on the biggest stadium. That it's a insane, yeah, it's huge. It's amazing environment. Yes, yep. wasn't uh, the World they, Cup final there? I think the, it was in Brazil. Yes, yeah, correct. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. And they have the Mono B with São Paulo plays that was pretty good too. So mm. yeah, so <clears throat> I would say those three that came to my mind. Nice. nice. I mean, those are those are very class responses. That concludes the three in the random questions. Now we have our closing questions. Everyone knows about these. Mac, you want to take the first one? I can, yes. So we ask all of our uh, interviewees this, but our mission, um, our mission statement is to create a community of passionate football fans who highlight the classy side of the game, keeping discussion positive, uplifting, and inspirational. Um, and as a podcast, we're kind of trying... Um, to create that positivity and that uplifting community around football when in a lot a lot of times in media there's a lot of hate and negativity towards players and teams. Um, what advice would you have for us and to our fans listening to help the footballing world become a better, more positive place? Um, I, the, the thing is, it, it's a sh- social problem. You know, it's not actually the, the sport. We just translate that to to a sport. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think when people start seeing uh, other people uh, by their color skin and where they live, and when you actually see neutral, we don't we see people. When we start seeing people, I think gonna translate that to to sports. And when translate to sport, it's gonna be a a way to where we we're gonna start liking people. I think we we need to start liking people, not like or what kind of hair they have, what kind of color of the skin they actually have, uh, where they're uh, where they're from. Um, so all I think when you start seeing transparent, I think we need to see transparency. Mm. Let's see transparent. Let's be transparent, and I think we're gonna be better people in better world. Um, and, and in that way, we're gonna like people in general. I think we we should not like if the the person is not good should not like if the person doesn't treat the uh, don't treat you well you know and not by the other things that the way we were born so if you tr- if you can translate that to to life that's going to translate to the game and i think it's going to be a way better um way better game way better life and way better world better world that's what we need mm-hmm. yeah i mean I, I love that it's beautiful better world it's, it's what we need the last question that we have, we ask everyone, sort of all encompassing, sort of talks about the entire interview. I mean, you just talked for an hour and a half about your whole football career. But in essence, why do we play football? Why did you go on this journey across the world? Why did you take all of these hours of training, all of this effort to become a footballer? What does it do for people? What does it do for our society? Why do we play football? And yeah, I think we have always, especially here in the United States, we have that conversation because why we don't like soccer the way that we like other sports? Why do we all don't like and treat and watch soccer the way we do with basketball, with football? And, and that's exactly it. I think when you grew up where everybody, the, the whole attention, the whole um, the culture is involved in one sport, I think that's where you want to be. If if you know if you're if you're in the jungle and you see a monkey jumping all over the, the trees and like oh I want to see that one, and if you yeah. see yeah if you see the crocodile eating all the animals around the 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 lake is like oh I want to be that crocodile. Yeah. So I think that's the attention that we're gonna get here. It's when in high school people start talking about it, and when mm-hmm. on Monday. When you get on Monday at, at school and you need to know the results of the MLS teams, 
because otherwise you're going to be left out from your 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 friends conversation that's why you want okay i want to play soccer i want to watch soccer i want to be a soccer player i want you guys to cheer for me i want to i want you to see me on on tv i want to be the next one you know and mm -hmm. sometimes people do that with i want to be a president i want to be the president i want to be you know um signing bills i want to be be there to make decisions so i think the same thing that I, they have to me the culturally you know if all this involved me in like okay i really like that sport i really wanted to be actually playing on those games i really wanted to and the sensation of, of scoring a goal i don't think i can describe i don't think it, nobody can describe me to actually score a goal in a uh, the winning goal, the last minute goal, or even a goal uh, was zero zero, and we score a goal, and then everybody everybody goes there to see a goal. Everybody goes there to see a goal. So when you go to a game, like oh, I don't want to see a foul, I don't want to see a corner, I want to see a goal. Yeah. So that yeah, that sensation translates to like culturally, this is the thing that I wanted to be doing. Yeah. And when you do it, and when you do it, it was like oh. That's really, really, really exciting, because uh, it it's it's every, what's every attention? Every, everybody's got attention in something. That's what drawn people to to be looking to do that. And I think in sports, even more in sports, when people uh, if they know know you, but they know you're an athlete, they would treat you differently. They would talk to you differently. They will. They'll see you as, oh, got something special. So, and even though like a surgeon studied more to be a surgeon, 12 years to be a surgeon, and a guy that played for 12 years, they're going to be seen in a society differently in the perspective of, I wanted to be that person, you know? Yeah. So I think... I think it, and I, and for sure that culturally that it, it gets us, and and after that you get the attention. After you get the attention, you start finding more about sport. When you start finding more about sport, you start play, and when you start playing, you start falling in love with the sport. And then from that point on, everything you do, everything you 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 walk thinking about soccer. You you run thinking about soccer. You eat and sleep about soccer. You want to be playing with, you, with your friends. The other day I read something like, "Did you remember the last time you played with your friends on on the street? That day happened and you didn't know." I was like, "Man, that's true. Yeah, that's true." When mm -hmm. and you you're probably the same thing. You're probably more recent than 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 I was. So you're like. Oh, when the last time I was I played on the street and I never play again. It was my last day. Yeah. And you never yeah. and you never know. Nobody comes to the pot. Oh, Leo. Sorry, but this is gonna be the last day. Go enjoy That's it. That's crazy There's to think about. Yeah. Yeah. It could always be just because of the way life takes you. It could always be your last time doing something. Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful way to end it. Like perfect way to end this kind of episode. Like Pablo said, identify what you want to do, figure out what it is, and then go after it. You know, like he was saying, you got to figure out what it is and you got to go after it. You never know when it's going to be your last day doing something, regardless of why. You know, this world is crazy, can take us in a lot of different directions. You might move across the ocean or across the country within a day. You might get traded between teams within a day. <laughs> Something can yeah. always happen and, and make your life go so differently. We see that in Pablo's life, you know, from when he's eight years old all the way until now with all the different teams that he's been at, all the different pit stops he's had to make to get where he is today. But in the end, it resulted in a very accomplished and successful career and an overall career that after talking with you for an hour and a half today, I can confidently say you look back at with gratitude and, and you, you feel nostalgic and happy for what you did. Uh, in a good way. And so I think that's that's a beautiful way to end it. Hope I really hope that everyone enjoyed this episode. I know that I did. It was awesome talking to you, Pablo. Thank you so much for coming out of the podcast. It really means a lot that we could get your story out there and share it with other people. If you ever want to come back onto the podcast, feel free. You're always welcome if you have more stories. And for everyone listening, I hope you have a good week. Hope you can watch some football and peace.